We sit here together. We're all on the same hilltop. And yet each of us is in a separate world. Each of us is experiencing our own suffering, our own pleasures, our own stress. And well, there's, there's a basic pattern that underlies the way you're experiencing these things. Still, you're suffering your pains, you're experiencing your pleasures, I'm experiencing mine. And we can know each other's only by extrapolation. And so, as John Fuhrer once commented, there's a certain loneliness to the practice. You're working with your own problems. The person next to you is working on hers. And it can seem very lonely, especially when you're not sitting here together, when you're sitting off on your own someplace else, surrounded by people who have very different values. In fact, it's often lonelier when you're surrounded by people with different values than it is when you're just sitting by yourself. You feel strange, you feel either unappreciated or misunderstood, or you're beginning to wonder if you're sane and they're the sane ones, or who's sane, you have no real idea, when things seem topsy-turvy. But there is a funny, strange kind of comfort when you stop to think about all the other people who are practicing, even though they're practicing on their own sufferings. There is a kind of fellowship that stretches around the world, that stretches back thousands of years. And it's good to tap into that when you can. I notice this a lot in Thailand. when. Being the only Western in the monastery, there are times I felt that even a John Fuhrung didn't understand some of the stuff I was going through. And I talked to some of the Thai people, and they seemed to be in very different worlds. But we did have certain values in common. And that created a sense of fellowship, a sense of strength. And tapping into that is a wise thing. It's very easy to focus on the things that make the practice difficult for yourself. And the more you focus on the difficulties, the, the harder it gets, the more you tie yourself up. And so it's good to stop and think about the things that make it easy. You notice this if you take a long walk, either doing walking meditation or going out for a hike. You start focusing on the parts of the body that hurt, that are sore, that feel tired. And it gets harder and harder and harder to walk. But if you focus on the areas that are comfortable, that are not feeling tired, the parts that are feeling energetic, you can walk for longer periods of time. So this is one of the important skills that enables you to develop stamina in the practice, is to focus on the areas where you do have advantages, where you do have comforts, where you do have things going well. And take strength from those. Take comfort from them. Because you might compare yourself, say, with the Forest of Johns and think about how they grew up in a society that supported them. They grew up with values that were conducive to the practice. They entered the monastic Sangha, which is a huge support. You say, well, I don't have those advantages, or I don't have all those advantages. But then again, you grow up in Thai society, you find that there are a lot of things that are actually contrary to Buddhist values. And because everything gets 
swept together into Buddhism over there. There are a lot of people who really can't sort things out, which part is animistic, which is part is Brahmanical, which part is Buddhist. It takes a lot of sorting out once you start practicing. We don't have that particular difficulty. And there are a lot of other difficulties. You think about the Ajans out in the forest when it's raining, when it's cold, when there's no food, when they find themselves in a part of the forest where the local people don't like meditating monks and actually trying to drive them away. There are stories of people putting glass out on the road where monks would go for their alms round. We don't have that here. Broken glass, disguised in the dust. People deciding that they have some sort of voodoo food. The idea you put something in food that could either kill somebody or that could bring them under your power. And then sometimes they would test it on wandering monks, figuring it didn't really matter. If the monk was really good, he he wouldn't die. <laughs> there is, there was that attitude. <clears throat> there was that attitude over there. You had the senior monks in Bangkok who were down on the forest tradition. I mean, they had they had their problems too, which we don't see. You look in the texts. You look in their biographies and autobiographies. There's a tendency not to talk about this, partly because some of it to this day is still kind of politically sensitive. And part of it, when they, if you were to talk about your difficulties, say you're writing your autobiography and you're talking about your difficulties, it just seems unseemly. For them, the whole point of their practice was not focusing on the difficulties, but finding where their strength was to put up with the difficulties so they could make light of the difficulties so they didn't really bother them. And I found in my own practice that this was an important principle. People have asked me sometimes, what was the most difficult thing about being in Thailand all those years? And I can't think of it. And the reason I can't think of it is because at the time I wasn't focusing on it. And it's not that there weren't difficulties, but I kept trying to find where I could find some strength inside myself. What was of value inside myself? And what was supportive in the environment? even though there are some things that seem to go against the practice. Even in meditation monasteries, you find people coming that get in, get in the way of your practice. All kinds of things. But you don't, you don't focus on it. You focus on where your strengths are. You focus on where the support is and try to make the most of that. And when you do that, you find you have a lot more stamina in the practice. So it comes down to that simple principle, count your blessings, what things are good in life. Years back I was reading an account of a, a kind of a diary this one woman made of her life in the frontier here in the States, basically giving instructions to her daughter and how to run a household. And just washing clothes was a huge production. She had to get the firewood, she had to start the firewood, get the pot on the fire, get the water hot enough. And they didn't have ready-made soap powder, so they had to make do with what they could find in the cleaning agents. And it took a lot of elbow grease to get those clothes clean. And at the end of her instructions, she said, okay, when you're finished, got the clothes all hung out on the line, take the water, you pour it on the flowers in front of the porch, and then you sit on the porch and you count your blessings. It's an important part of the directions on how to wash your clothes, wash the family's clothes. It's a, it's a good principle in the practice. Count your blessings. 
recognize where you have problems, recognize that there are difficulties, recognize that there are parts of the mind that are not 100 percent with the practice. Sometimes we try to deny that, which doesn't help. We're not living in Pollyanna land. Or we may not like the idea that there's a part of us that doesn't like to sit down and do the practice all the time. That kind of denial doesn't help. Be clear about where the difficulties are, but also be clear on where your advantages are, where your strengths are, where things are going well. The things you do have to rely on, they're there. And learn how to draw strength from them. And that's half the battle right there, if not more. <laughs>